you can walk in Monday morning trying to learn about Mr. Smith, that Mr. Smith was billed to you as being very stable. And as you're coming onto the floor, the patient becomes very ill and you all of a sudden have to, with very little information, have to figure out what is the best thing to do to stabilize this patient. Should this patient stay with you on this floor or be moved to an intensive care setting? And even if that's what you decided to do, the intensive care bed is not always available. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Dorcas, and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. Nkem Mbojigwe. Nkem is a physician leader and practicing hospitalist at Johns Hopkins Hospital. She completed her training at Mass General Hospital and currently serves as the clinical director and the Director of Operations for the Johns Hopkins Division of Hospital Medicine. In addition, she serves as the medical lead for Johns Hopkins Hospital at Home and as the medical director for several other inpatient multidisciplinary teams. She's the winner of the 2022 Society of Hospital Medicine Physician of the Year Award and describes herself as having a passion for healthcare innovation, strategy, and operations. Now, I was lucky enough to work with NCHEM when we both were training at Mass General and I'm just thrilled to have her join us on the podcast. Her vision of performance as a hospitalist is both somewhat different and definitely complementary to the mental models we've seen from other medical providers, and there's just a ton to learn here. We dig into the sometimes confusing role of perfection in elite performance. We talk about balancing vertical and longitudinal decision-making under pressure, and we go into the layer cake style model of acuity in healthcare in the United States. Before we get started, a quick reminder If you want to join individuals and teams around the world who are working to perform better during times of crisis and emergency, there are so many ways to get involved with the Emergency Mind Project community, and we would love to have you. The easiest way to get started is to take the free crisis skills test, which you can find right at the top of emergencymind.com. Okay, all that said, let's jump into this awesome episode with Dr. Nkem Mbojigwe. I hope you enjoy. Nkem, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It is like just awesome to see you again and thrilled to have you in in this capacity talking to folks and and sharing some of your uh, your wisdom here. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Amazing. So can can you give folks just like a huge overview of of who you are and and what you do and then we'll drill into a lot of the the awesome pieces in there. Yeah, so right now I am a practicing hospitalist at Jones Hopkins Hospital. I also serve as the clinical director for the Division of Hospital Medicine, sort of getting to serve, I think, that a large group of amazing individuals doing a lot of hard things every day, as well as a lot bunch of non-clinical staff and working with a team of fabulous nurses and techs. And it's just, it's been a great opportunity. I also wear many other hats as well. So Separately, we can talk about this or not talk about this. Consul at Home really is an emerging field in medicine. And so I sort of serve as the director of strategy for that here at Hopkins as well. But uh, before sort of what I do right now, if it's helpful, sort of my journey into sort of how I got to where I am today. So I, when I was little, I don't remember when I made the decision to answer me a doctor. To be completely honest, I know people have this like, you know, my grandfather, you know, my uncle stubby toe. And so I decided to be a doctor. And I don't remember ever crystallizing that way for me. I just remember growing up in Nigeria where I was born. I did get malaria a lot. And I remember going, we always used to go to see this doctor who in retrospect, you know, his office was the shadiest thing. <laughs> in retrospect, it was like a hole in the wall. And no matter what I, I, I thought, how I felt, he just saved malaria. So who really knows? But when I would go see him, he was always the kindest, the nicest. You know, when he had to give me shots, he was nice. When I fell off a swing and had to get vitamin K shots, which again, in retrospect, I don't know that that was medically a thing to do. But I, <laughs> he was like so nice. And I was like, you know, I, I loved that anytime I would go see him as a kid, he would just ask me a couple of questions and be like, oh, this is what this is. And I, so I think that like, mystery solving piece really appealed to me. And I somehow subconsciously decided I was going to become a doctor and then moved to the U.S. from college. And then, as you know, we met during our internal med- when I was doing my internal medicine residency at Mass General. And then in 2017 came the Hopkins that have been here ever since. So, mm. yeah. yeah. I have so many questions about the vitamin K <laughs> and malaria and all of that stuff, which, which we might come back to at some point. Yeah, but, totally. totally. Um, 
So one of the many reasons that I'm like so excited to have this conversation with you is that we we actually haven't on this podcast at all brought in anybody that does hospital medicine before. And that's not because it's not critically important in the care of patients and in the provision of medical care. And it's not because it's not like fantastically interesting in terms of the way that it handles like risk and uncertainty. It's actually just that like, it's a total oversight on my part. So that said, I'm happy to correct that. You know, hospital medicine is a thing that doesn't exist in every place. So can we start with that? Like what is hospital medicine and what is a hospitalist? No, I think that's a great question. I will say, at least in the U.S., um, because I recently found hospital medicine means something else in Europe, in parts of Europe. So in the U.S., a hospitalist or someone who practices hospital medicine, first of all, they've gone through inter- an internal medicine residency. They complete that residency, and then they usually have, you know, one of three paths, as you know. They either decide to subspecialize, say, become a heart doctor or a GI doctor and then pursue that training. Or they can say, you know what, I completed my residency training. I enjoy taking care of adult patients, which is what someone in internal medicine would do. And then it's really a decision about where they want to focus their practice. So do they want to be an internist or a GP? Cool. They set up their shop. They have a clinic. They have patients who come, you know, into clinic for various ailments or management of chronic disease. And then they go back home and that's primarily where they practice. And I think that's how most people see internists or as their primary care physician, or they decide that they like the acuity or practice of being hospital based. And so they mostly take care of, I'm saying adult, but they can also be pediatric patients, but they take care of patients who are admitted to the hospital or stay in the hospital getting treatment uh, for a variety of ailments or illnesses. So they typically don't provide the same longitudinal chronic disease care as say your primary care physician would, even though it's the same board certification, the same trip. That's hospital medicine. And so, the, so if you've ever had the unfortunate circumstance of being ill and needing to be in a hospital, more likely than not, at this point in the field, you've, it's large enough that you've probably ran into a hospitalist who somehow took care of you while you're in the hospital but you may not see that person in clinic in your day-to-day life. This, that's how I think I'd put it. So as we think about the different types of teams that operate under different types of pressure, it is, you know, we sort of use the emergency mind lens on a lot of this stuff. Like a couple salient features of that are one, that hospitalists practice within a specific hospital or hospital system, right? So you are embedded in a place and you are not actively going out and seeking problem sets, problem sets come to you, right? Like patients are admitted to you and then you take care of that patient. So that gives you some control over your surroundings and to some extent your team. And you get to use those resources to try to figure out how to solve a variety of problems for for different folks. The other thing that's important to think about is the level of acuity and the time course of the problem sets that y'all are solving as hospitalists, right? So and correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, but generally speaking, if somebody's very sick, they come into the emergency department or to an emergency department. They are tuned up or initially worked on by an ER doc or surgeons or whoever. And then when they're more stable than that, they're admitted under the care of a hospitalist. And there's sort of this medium ground, right? Because in a lot of times, if they become too sick or overly sick, they go into an intensive care unit. And often that's a different group and a different team that's solving it. So there's sort of like this... I don't know, Goldilocks level of of pressure that's like that's like in your realm. Am, am I getting yeah. that right? You are, but I will put uh, Vinny, I'll put some tweaks on that. You are right that they are all hospitals tend to be focused our uh, practice within a hospital or a number of hospitals within a health system really sort of depends on where the person works. But I think what a hospitalist can do honestly varies quite widely. So you're right for most places like you know where I work currently. You know, when I would encounter certain problems or have to deal with that certain things that come up tends to be in that, you know, either someone has already made the decision that a patient's sick enough to come into the hospital and then I'm taking over their care. And then if they get any sicker to where they now need intensive care, it goes to someone else. But there are lots of places around the country and even local to me here where the hospitalist is anywhere from that person in the emergency room. So there are hospitalists who actually, even though they are 
um, board certified frontal medicine work just like an emergency doctor. You see that, especially in rural areas in the country mm-hmm. uh, where they're providing that care and that acute care, even in the emergency room and facing all of those problem sets and all of those emergencies. Mm-hmm. To the other end of the spectrum as well, it's actually more common than people saying that hospitalists work in the intensive care unit setting, providing that level of care as well. So I think while they do tend to be in that middle ground of, you know, sick but stable, there is a huge bell curve in terms of when they first start interacting with the patient all the way from when they're, you know, not maybe doing well in the ED all the way up to taking care of them in the intensive care setting. So I do think that our hospitalists who could potentially also be in that emergency mindset, either on the floor, which we may be talking mm-hmm. about later in terms of when a patient all of a sudden was stable and now it's not. When they are first brought in by emergency services into the ED and it's the hospitalist who's trying to stabilize them or in the intensive care unit as well. And we saw that with COVID, which we can also talk about. Oh yeah, absolutely, right? So, so that's phenomenally interesting because now you have individuals who have received the same training right? They've received internal medicine training and they operate in systems which are wildly different, right? In some systems, they're primarily responsible for this middle ground of severity and acuity. And in other systems, they're responsible for wide swaths of this person's journey through different realms that are very different of uncertainty and acuity, which is an incredible thing because you have almost this natural experiment behind that. Now, I know most of the time in your career, you've worked in a system that has that sort of layer cake approach to it, right? Where there's like the right. middle, I don't know, the, the the filling of the layer cake. Or I don't know. Yeah, maybe we can go cream cheese frosting. Exactly. Yeah, there we go. Okay. It's gonna, it's gonna, we'll come back. I'm clearly haven't had breakfast yet. That's going to come back to my, my mind at some point later, later in this episode. But, if, but you know, you're working in this layer cake approach where, where you're sort of tackling the middle ground as the space where... Maybe you feel most comfortable where the decisions are and the problems such are the ones you like working on the most or 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 whatever right. it is. H- have you spent time in a different type of system where you get the whole the whole slice of cake? I don't know. The metaphor is not quite working. No, no, no. I know you're saying I personally have not, because as you rightly put, right, one of the I think one of the very appealing things about hospital medicine is you're not boxed into a certain care setting. So if you are the sort of individual who really likes the adrenaline and rush and, you know, rapid fire decision making that is required if you're working the emergency department or even in an urgent care setting, which is a whole other thing, right? An urgent care setting or an intensive care unit. There are many places that have hospitals, hospitalists that work in, in, in those areas. But I will say, you know, I don't want to leave the audience thinking, you know, the, the cream cheese frosting, the middle layer is, is a place where you, don't have fast-paced decision making. I just think the emergency oh, mindset could be different. You know, you have, I think it's a whole other thing to walk in as a hospitalist. You know, it's, I think, similar to for my colleagues like yourself in emergency medicine, where you're, you know, you have a different doctor. It's not the same doctor Monday through Sunday, and it's not the same patient Monday through Sunday. And so you have to be able to come into a situation, rapidly assess it and come up with a plan that's very similar for a hospice, as I think, for emergency medicine. And I think the patient could just be acute. You can walk in Monday morning trying to learn about Mr. Smith, that Mr. Smith was billed to you as being very stable. And as you're coming onto the floor, the patient becomes very ill and you all of a sudden have to, with very little information, have to figure out where is, what is the best thing to do to stabilize this patient? Should this patient stay with you on this floor or be moved to an intensive care setting? And even if that's what you decided to do, the intensive care bed is not always available. So then you still have to, you know, there's, and we can go into it. There's, I think, um, even absent of having that opportunity to work in an intensive care setting or other more high acuity areas, there's still, I think, even in that middle ground scenarios where it can be very scary. You know, if you're working Absolutely. at a rural hospital, I'm not trying to, you know, dog or rural hospital. I don't know why this just comes to mind, but, you know, where resources are less. So if you're the hospitalist and you're taking care of a patient who's having a heart attack and your hospital does not have access to cardiologists or individuals who can do the procedure to open up that that uh, patient's hard block and to manage them. Well, until you can transfer the patient to that institution, who's going to be managing that heart attack? The hospitalist. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Well, often with very limited resources in that setting. Yeah. And, I, and I'm so interested by this because I completely agree with you. We often draw this very arbitrary line between the decision making and thought processes of the downstairs in the hospital, the ER, and the upstairs in the hospital, which is often the hospitalists and the intensive care units. But in reality, all of us are taking situations of uncertainty and mismatches of resources and needs and trying to do the best we can for this wide variety of, of patients. We're right. also both doing this, both upstairs and downstairs are doing this in uh, in parallel. We both have you know sort of teams of people that we're looking out for, and each of those people might be needing different things at different times. So so actually, so let's let's push on that, right? Let's push on some of the decision making that you have when you're working with uh, an individual patient, right? So you get a patient that at least has some sort of tag on them of what's going on, which might or might not be correct, and we can definitely dig into you yep. know anchoring bias and all that sort of thing. But what does I don't know if this is the right way to ask this question, but but as as you're approaching that person in your first contact with them, right? So you're admitting this patient, this patient's being admitted to you. What is that thought process like? How do you think about your decision making? How do you think about the pressure you're feeling in that moment? And and take me through that that first contact a little. No, I think that's a great question. And I'm gonna I'm going to if it's okay, reflect out loud on a shift yeah. I actually did last week uh, when I was moonlighting and, and admitting a patient, you know, at least where I currently work, because it's can vary place to place, when we are, you know, our emergency at physician colleagues are the ones who make the decision that someone's sick enough to be in the hospital. When that's done, it's sort of everything goes over to us. And so when I went down to meet this patient that I'd heard about and they were like, you know, you know, they're like, oh, go take a look and see if, you know, you think the patient's appropriate. So that's sort of the first decision making tree, right, is making sure that, yes, this other person made this decision that this patient's ill enough to be in the hospital. You then have two decisions to make. One, do you agree or disagree? And if you agree that the patient's sick enough, do you agree that they're stable enough, even though they're sick, to come to a medical floor, which is not, you know, it's acute, but not high acuity, or are they much sicker and they need to go to an intensive care unit? And sure. And so that's usually sort of the first decision tree in thinking is you're going to meet the patient. The other aspect, as you're meeting the patient and getting prepared for potential surprise that they're much sicker than you think is, you know, you can leave the chart all you want and you can get, you know, a report from your colleague as much as you want, but you don't know what you're walking into. Or you don't know if you're going to walk into that room and the patient is so upset that you're screaming, they're ripping out their peripheral IVs, which is... I, very common, actually. So you don't know if you're walking into that sort of maybe not medically acute scenario, but one more where you may be able to concern, maybe be concerned for the patient's safety, your safety, the safety of your team, and needing to very rapidly de-escalate while keeping your eye on what the acute medical issues are. But I think outside of that, you know, barring the patient, you know, isn't coding when you walk into the room, which has happened to me once, uh, where it was like, oh, is coming in for a urinary tract infection. I walk in, he's like, I thought you said he's responsible, that he's not talking at all. And we have to tell the patient. Or the patient is screaming, ripping the IVs, throwing the table. It, it pretty much, I think, is otherwise quite mellow. Most interactions, I believe, for the hospital is just, you're going to meet the patient, just like when you're a doctor, you're getting the story, you're trying to figure out, you know, one is the... Problem number one, you were told really what's going on, or is it something else? What, in what order do I need to prioritize these issues? And who do I need to reach out to? And what's the timeline, right? So mm-hmm. even though they're sick but stable, it could be that they're having a form of a heart attack going back to that example. But it's not something where they need to go and get an intervention right this second. But you're realizing it's 4 p.m., the cardiologist may be going on soon. So while I have to figure out what's going on in this patient to stabilize them, I also need to put on my mental checklist right now. I need to make sure I call the cardiologist ASAP to make sure they're aware of this patient. They can do what they need to do within the next 12 hours or so. Now, before I keep rambling, I want to pause and see if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the types of things that we're experiencing here, right? Because our, our whole mission is to think about how to apply knowledge under pressure. Right. And there's this incredible bank of knowledge that you have, that hospitalists have, that about how to take care of people over time. Right. Mm. And and one of the facets that makes it interesting is that you have 
a little bit like you have a scarce resource, which is, you know, hospital space. You have a scarce resource, which is time, right? And you have to figure out how to apply these two resources to this field of patients. And some of the pressure you're facing is resource availability. Some of it is timing of operations, right? Like you can only do a certain test or you can only do a certain procedure, certain hours of certain days which is like a whole different conversation because like, why do we still work like that? Like, yes. that's ridiculous, yes. but yes. Okay, whatever. In any case, that that is just the reality, right? Like certain things are only available to you at certain times. And you're sort right. of, you're looking at this person that you have still a lot of uncertainty about, about what's going to happen, what's going to happen next. You're mapping this person to these different mental models that you have. You're trying to predict what's going to happen. And then you're superimposing that on this knowledge base of the hospital system to say, okay, what do I think the path of this person is? How am I going to land this plane? What's going to happen next? And that's such an interesting thought process and an interesting interface of knowledge under pressure because it's not just one moment. It's actually like a string of moments that all have to sort of come together in the right way. And I'm super curious about that. That is so right. And and let me go back to what I had actually said I was going to do, which is reflect on the shift last because then maybe I think that would be a good example. So to you, so that was a, a shift that was supposed to go from 4 p.m. to midnight where the expectation of that shift is that you do up to, you complete up to four admissions, meaning you have to, you know, from, for lack of a better word, from head to toe, assess a patient, come up with a medical plan that's safe and a NAPGAP plan. Again, this is for four different patients, all who have a milieu of medical issues, not just what brought them to the hospital, but other things that you pick up, other things that you were wondering about, and therefore you have to figure out how you're going to test for them, can you test for them, can you test for them in what time frame, and you have to do all of this within the space of eight hours, which, you know, on average, that's two hours per patient, which might seem like a lot of time, but it really is not. When you come on that, and I say that because when you come on that shift, right, you know, you don't have any control over how many patients are available to be admitted, when they're going to be ready to actually leave the emergency department, where they're going to go in the hospital or when they're actually going to move from the emergency department. So there's just so many patient factor variables that you have new. So you could be there, you can arrive at four o'clock and think to have on average two hours per patient in terms of being able to do those admissions, but you might not get your first admission to 6 p.m., 7 p.m. You're still expected to do four. So now that time shifted but you're still expected to do the same amount of work to the same quality, to the same uh, level of completeness, right? And again, it, because, you know, you, who knows when Mr. Smith is going to walk into the ED, right? So you have no control over that. And again, reflecting on that shift, you know, you can, your first patient, you know, they might have been billed as tummy and with chest pain. And you go and meet the patient and they're acutely suicidal. The chest pain is, you know, the least of their issues. They are having a bit of auditory and visual hallucinations at the same time. You're looking at their lab work. They're clearly floridly infected with something while being acutely psychotic. And they're all of these things that you're having to figure out like, okay, you know, what other resources do I need? What other testing do I need? In what order do I need to do this? And I still have three other patients that may be coming down the pipe uh, while I'm trying to stabilize this patient. Make sure I have a plan. You can talk about documenting later. Make sure I document the whole plan, call all the people I need to, and I need to wrap this up tightly for all four patients. And so I think that's where potentially that conflagration of issues, time, resources, knowledge of how the hot soul works, and also working in a team because you may need to consult other people, but it's after hours. So are you going to really wake somebody up in the middle of the night to sort something out? Working with the units who maybe are finding out that this patient, they're worried because they're seeing that he's acutely psychotic. And so you have to convince them that the patient can come to the floor. There are all these things that you're balancing. But then at the end of your shift, again, you have to make sure that the plan and everything that you've done is so tightly Wound in a book because you have to then give that information to your colleague who's going to cover overnight. So, you know, this shift that I had my first patient really come to me around six o'clock. I think I was blessed to be able to do everything and be done by 1130. I think that just comes with doing this over time and being efficient. But you can imagine it's, it's really luck of the draw what, what you have to handle at a certain night if you're able to get done on time and may have to stay late. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, okay. There's there's so many interesting things to to dig into there as we think about the overlapping components of uncertainty and and thought process. And I'm going to draw a distinction between two things and and correct. You know, like feel free to break down this wall because it's kind of an it's kind of a you know fake thing I'm putting up. But for a moment, I'd like to separate out two things that you said. One is your knowledge of the system and the unit that you're practicing in. Right. And in that bucket, I'm going to put things like when are certain tests available in this hospital? What is the preference of the charge nurse on unit six or you know, whatever the stuff is right. that's hyper local knowledge that works in that system? I'm going to put that in bucket one. And in bucket two, I'm going to put all the stuff that you're doing in your head, right? All the stuff that you're planning as you're multi-threading these different systems and you're sort of sorting through stuff and and separate those out. I realize that's artificial because really you're doing these two things at once all the time and you have to. Right. But to make it easier for all of us to, you know, to, to peer inside your brain for a minute, let's separate that out. And, and if we can, let's start with the internal piece of it. So when you look at yourself as a doctor now, and you compare that to when you started, or you compare that to, you know, me, if you forced me to be a hospitalist, right? And I would really struggle with it, right? What would somebody who is not as good as you at doing that job struggle with? And, or what did you used to struggle with that now feels easy to you when you're making these decisions? No, that is a great question. I think the first thing I think I'd say for anyone, and I think this applies to all doctors, but it's the decision tree between sick, not sick, necessary, but not acute. And I'm going to explain what that means. Sick, not sick is relatively straightforward. But when you're finding out, you know, you're, you, you're being told you're, you're going to admit four patients. You know very little about all four. And because they're adults and they're humans, they typically have more than one problem. They usually have many. And so you have to very quickly in your mind triage. And you also have to be able to re-triage. So you've heard about the four admissions. You may just know their names and their chief complaint. You have to be able to quickly scan their chart or see the patient and go through a very large amount of clinical information very quickly, but thoroughly. And very quickly make the decision of, of these four, who should I see first, second, third, fourth, based upon how sick I think they are. And as you're going through that list, being able to quickly, quickly retrash if you find out that patient number two is actually much sicker than patient number one, then I need to be able to move those donors out. And also to, to take it a step further, I need to figure out in my mind, not just sick versus not sick, but how sick are they? Because then going to that other bucket, I may need other resources that I need to pull in and that I need to pull in in a timely fashion. I think that's separate from, and the second bucket is where I think you know, even I struggled initially in residency and where I think some hospitalists might still struggle. And so, you know, hospitalists, I, I think with just like with any doctor, they, they want to be thorough. They want to do a good job. But because adults come with a multitude of issues, sometimes it can be very easy to get lost in the weeds. So you have a patient that came in with chest pain, but then you found like they have this huge mass in their in their stomach, their right leg is twice the size of the left leg. And so there are all these things that can be acute. And I'm inferring that they might have a mass that's obstructing their belly. And that's why they're also having nausea vomiting that no one told you about. And maybe they also have an acute blood clot. And that's why their right leg is greater than their left. All of these things are things that need to be, you need to test for pretty quickly. And they're all things that you need to figure out pretty quickly. But then you have four other patients and you've not even gotten into all the other medical problems this one patient has. And so I think further that to appear into the mind of a hospitalist is in addition to trying to figure out sick, not sick, there's also this dance of trying to figure out in what order do I attack all these issues? I need to be thorough. But I need to be thorough in an efficient way. I need to be thorough in a time-sensitive way. I can't spend my whole time trying to peer into this patient's diabetes because even though it's critically important, this other thing, this other lab value might be higher acuity. And if I'm so focused on this, I'm going to miss that that lab value just popped up. Or I'm not going to have time to go to this other patient who I need to see who I think is not sick, but I don't know. So I think it's that struggle, and I see that with residents often, especially when they're interns, is you can feel like boiling an ocean in an hour. You're being asked to see this patient, and they come in with this one complaint, 
But then you find all these other things they may not have told you about, but they're just as urgent. <laughs> they also have all these other issues that are not urgent, but you have to treat quickly too. All within a small amount of time, you have to figure out how they all fit together. You have to then go into this other bucket of local knowledge, make things work. Oh, and you're also being paged by the nurse on this unit and being paged by this other thing and this other patient to compensating over here. We've not even talked about the fact that hospitals are typically doing this while covering sick patients elsewhere in the hospital. So I think that's where sort of that if you peer into that minor of hospitalist at any given point in time, we're often thinking of about 20 different things per patient at a time and constantly either re-triaging or doing the sick, not sick dance in their mind while also factoring hyperlocal knowledge and factoring in time because a lot of hospitalists work a lot of six times. So you don't have 24 seven, do you need to sort everything out come up with a plan, enact that plan in a way that keeps that patient safe and gets them better all by, I don't know, 536, whatever your, you know, your shift is done for the day. So oh, I would say where I've yeah. seen most people struggle is really that like, wow, this patient came in with chest pain. And I think it's even worse when you don't know what it's being caused by, but clearly the patient's in distress and you need to figure it out. They're quite sick. You need to figure out all, you also can't need to pay attention to all the other things that are going on with them. That's just as acute because I think people think, I don't want the audience to walk away thinking the hospitalist comes in, everyone has chest pain. They can have chest pain and something else and a third and a fourth thing. And they're all the number one problem. Yeah. And they're all acute, but you have like 10 other patients. Well, we right. are. And if you don't pay absolutely perfect attention to one small change in the medication, that's like, the 15th problem down the list, tomorrow they're going to catch on fire and explode, right? Exactly. Like you have to balance all these different threads of time, which is one of the things that I'm always so impressed with, with, with you and with my hospitalist colleagues, the, your ability to track those multiple vectors over time for one patient and across patients. I think that's a different problem set than in some ways what we face in the emergency department where a lot of the issues are right now or maybe sort of peri right now. But we don't necessarily think the same way longitudinally about it, which is which is so fascinating to me. What what does that feel like for you? Like you're describing, you know, a billion thoughts sort of floating around in space. Like, does it feel? Is there a pressure feeling, and then a sense of relief when you find a plan that that threads the needle? Is it a sense of confusion that crystallizes? You know, I'm thinking like the last time I worked on a hospital medicine team was. 10 years ago, something like that, when I was an intern, yeah. right? Like, it, like it's been a long time since I did this kind of thinking, right? But it's fascinating to me how that type of thinking evolves for you. And maybe this is a question about how you're still evolving your thinking or what you're still working on for it. So I don't know, take that wherever you want to go with it. No, I was going to say, I think the best example I can give is to use myself. You know, when I first went into residency, I was not planning on being a hospitalist. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but hospital medicine was on my on my radar. I, I as a resident sometimes felt quite overwhelmed because I'm a perfectionist. And so that's why I was talking about that, you know, needing to know a lot about a lot at the same time felt slightly like boiling the ocean all the time. And so I wanted to subspecialize initially in part because I was interested in the field that I was thinking about subspecializing. But, you know, reflecting back, I think there's a part of me that was like, wow, you know, having some sort of narrowing of this focus might feel less overwhelming. So if I'm just going to focus on the GI tract, if I'm as, and that's going to be my specialty or just on the part, then at least it's still a lot of information and a lot that I need to know, but it's less broad than hospital medicine. And I do think a lot of people feel that way early in their career in hospital, it, even in residency, right? It just feels like it's a lot. I need to know a lot about it, a lot for internal medicine. I think over time, I think when you, you know, really, you're, you're, by the time you see certain cases over and over again, and also when you hone your own craft, so you own your own workflow, you hone how you work. I think that really helps. So now I think, you know, when I think about my typical clinical work day, 
I'm used to saying sort of workflow for five years. I feel therefore differently now when I'm going to say a Monday when I start my week and I'm walking in to nine patients I know zero about, like literally zero about, and I need to get to know, and I need to get to know quickly because their plan needs to move ahead. I need to figure out what's sick, not sick, who's sick, not sick, what, you know, what's urgent versus can wait an hour or two. And I typically have about 30 minutes between 8 to 8.30 to sort that out. That I think that's gotten easier for me over time. But I think there's still those moments that, you know, you don't really know anything about the patient. You're called to the patient bedside. They're not doing very well. You know, you need to figure out, I don't know what I don't know. What do I need to know right now? What can I wait two to three minutes to find out? What can I wait 10 minutes to find out? And who else do I need to be here is something that I think hospitalists still deal with every day. Hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I think we're touching on here a, a really interesting theme, which is how the desire for and the want to achieve perfection sometimes is a driver towards excellence and sometimes really is a detractor away from excellence. Yes. Right. And finding that balance as you continue to grow. Right. And we think about, you know. So much of what we talk about on the Emergency Mind Project is training high performance teams, right? Teams and individuals that perform at elite levels under extreme pressure. And yeah. perfection is rarely a thing that we end up talking about. Really? Because it's sometimes, like you're describing now, sometimes is a forcing function towards or away from actual excellence. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, you know. When I think of, if I were, if I were asked to describe what a high performing hospital is clinically looks like, right? Because I think there are many th other things that should factor into what a high performing hospital is. And I know there are government metrics that also dictate what a high performing hospital is that we're not going to talk about. But I would say, contrary, I think, to what most people think, it's not house. It's not the person that you see, because, you know, more or less he was a hospitalist. Let's, you know, but it, it's not that individual who is able to find those rare esoteric diagnoses, although that is part of it. I think it's that individual who is able to walk into a unit of 24 patients. They've never met them before. Everyone's running to them saying patient in room nine needs this, patient in room eight needs this, oh, and patient in this other place, their blood pressure is dropping, this other person is screaming in pain, and this other person is short of breath. And maybe not even know the patient's names. They might just know room numbers. And they're very quickly and accurately able to say, I'm going to see the patient with a low blood pressure. Can you quickly go and do this? Uh, get, you know, whatever measurement or lab test you need for the patient with short of breath. And also inquire what else is going on with that patient with shortness of breath. So you can figure out, do I need to re-triage and see the shortness of breath patient first before the low blood pressure? Figuring out what you need. Can you go and get some more viral signs while I pop in to see the patient with low blood pressure? know what questions you're going to very quickly ask that patient if you're just trying to assess that they mentating well. While again, re-triaging. Am I fine to stay in this room with a low blood pressure? Or really it's like, this is actually what their blood pressure usually is. And I, but the patient short, short as the button really is very sick and I need to run there. Can you dose that other person? At the same time, say that patient with pain, if they're, can you get their vital signs? And if they're stable, can you please give them medication? And oh, can you let that other patient know who's swimming out? You're doing all of this at the same time while thinking, do I need more help here? Do I need to go call lab and get the lab people up here? What labs do I need? Because what diagnosis am I suspecting? You're doing all of this at the same time and doing it very well and doing it in a way that's collegial. You're not barking by your nursing right. colleague. Right. You're not screaming at people, but you're also very appropriately triaging and constantly I keep going back to that triaging and re-triaging. Like at very good hospital, I think, like I said, you're always being pulled in multiple directions, all of which are acute. While all of this is happening, you might be getting paid or you have a new admission, right? <laughs> so you also have to sure. be able to, okay, see, no blood pressure patient. Let me just quickly figure out if they're awake and talking. And being able to quickly pivot to the person who's short of breath while at least giving some preliminary relief to the person who is in 10 out of 10 pain while asking the person in emergency room to say, hey, if that patient's stable, can you just give me five minutes? That's that. And doing all of this well and stabilizing everybody within 15 minutes and everyone's happy. But you dive hospitalists may not know that the patient with low blood pressure, you know, also had 
a cabbage two months ago and they might not need to know. I don't know. I'm just saying being able to take, know what's pertinent information to perform under a short, high pressure period of time across multiple domains, across multiple patients and often across multiple different parts of the hospital in a way that keeps, so keeps all the patients safe and gives them high quality care in a timely manner. That's a high performing hospitals. I'm having flashbacks to some of our 3 a.m. conversations at Mass General where we're saying, you know, you're the medical senior and I'm the ER senior and we're both sort of like, okay, what the hell do we do here with this right. massive amount of, of data and people and everything? And, you know, but, right. but I'm, I'm really struck by the way you're describing what I guess you could call sort of like vertical and longitudinal decision making, right? Because you have this like one swath through everything where you have to make all these decisions but then at the same time, or maybe a few minutes later, you're also applying this totally different set of longitudinal mental models that tracks one person over an extended period of time, right? You're thinking about what do I need to make decisions for for my whole team right now? And then this person, geez, how could I make his diabetes control slightly better over the next three days while they're here? And that cognitive flexibility is so amazing to me, right? Because you're bouncing in and out of these situations where you really have to apply emergency style mental models and into situations where you really need to apply other more internal medicine mental models. And we know quite well that those mental models don't necessarily translate between those two spaces, right? What works in longitudinal, slower, more deliberative thinking really will backfire if you try to apply it to an acutely short of breath dying patient, but also vice versa, Right, what works in the ER really does not provide optimal longitudinal inpatient care, and it's so fascinating to bridge that gap back and forth. I think I was let me let me say I wish that I'd had a deeper appreciation for that in my training and mm. been able been more sure of myself and been able to learn more from my colleagues like that. I think that we often have this barrier between the different groups, this friction between the different cultures that that prevents really efficient learning and efficient sharing like that, but. But I, I'm, in, I am, I have been and remain incredibly impressed at your ability to sort of like cognitively flex back and forth between those those model sets. I, I will say, you know, if you want, of course, you know, thank you. And I completely agree. I think that you know, there, there's cultures I think in medicine today that I think prevent us from learning more from each other than I think we ordinarily could. But I will say, you know, you touch on something that I want to draw out a little bit because at the very beginning of our conversation, we talked about you know, the wide variety of scenarios, or should I say places that have hospitals work. And you were talking about, you know, the natural experiment of people, you know, potentially working one area or the other. And I think it sort of boils down, in my mind at least, to what you talked about, right? Because you're right, a hospital is no matter where they're put, they're constantly, I think in many ways, a, a merge of an emergency room physician and an internist to some degree, you have to be able to bounce back and, or not even bounce back and forth. You really need to operate in both lanes all the time. Being able to appropriately manage, I'm going to use the word hyperacute, right? Because all the patients are acutely ill, but the hyperacute, all of a sudden the patient is extremely short of breath. You need to be able to manage that while simultaneously driving forward the patient who has congestive heart failure that you're trying to give them medication to remove fluid off so they don't become like the patient who is now a you know, hyper acutely right. breath, right? And all these patients eventually, hopefully need to leave the hospital at some point. So you also need to keep driving their care forward. And I think where people struggle is, and where maybe people will self-select, is you know, the individuals who like the truly hyper acute may be the ones who like to work in an institution where they tend to get to work in the emergency department and intensive care setting. So you get that flavor. But they are also the ones who may have patients who stay, I mean, longer in the hospital because they're so focused on the hyperacute that the things that are acute but important to continue to treat and drive forward are not as much paid attention to or vice versa, right? The individual who loves yeah. and who doesn't really feel comfortable in those sort of very acute, I need to make a decision on very little information. You know, they don't like those scenarios or those settings and so feel very uncomfortable if a patient who was, you know, sick but stable is moving forward and now they're decompensating and they don't sort of feel comfortable managing that patient can also struggle as well. And I think we're all at some point on that spectrum, but you have to be able to do both, I think, to be high functioning in this field, I think. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about 
the moment when it becomes an emergency, right? And you sort of cross this barrier into this, you know, what you'd call a liminal space. Like there's no way out, but through, you can't just sort of like hang out and see what happens. Like they'll die unless you do something. And, And that requires a different set of, of problem solving skills and mental models, but it's almost equally important to recognize when you're not there, right? When it's like, concerning and important, but not actually into a crisis yet. And what you really should apply is the tools that work in that scenario. What, what is that like for you, right? As somebody who has, you know, two, two bags of tools with them at all times, right? You've got these different toolkits. How do you know which bag to reach into? How do you make that decision? You know, obviously if their heart stops and they're dead, that's a fairly obvious one, right? Like, you know, right. go for the emergency toolkit, right? right? But like when that's not the case, when it's not so stark, are you conscious of that when you're leading a team? Are you calling people out based on which set of like, hey, folks, right now we're going to operate in a, you know, medium acuity CHF model or like, how are you actually sort of deciding which to use and communicating that to your team? Hmm, that's a good question. Let me pontificate out loud for a second. I think my mind, I know I think we might just use that word. Well, that's great. First, first use of pontificate on this podcast. Thank you very much. Happy, happy that we've achieved that level of uh, You're very of, welcome. Uh, I feel like it's a bell that I should <laughs> You know, I, I personally don't know that I, I do that consciously at this point, to be completely honest. I do think that I keep using that sick, not sick. And it's not because I think there are patients in the hospital that are not sick. I'm saying, I'm using that to say to triage, right? Sure. So, you know, if I was working with a resident team and I come in and I say, you know, I keep using Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith is someone who has been billed as an individual who has the diagnosis of hypertension. But I've noticed over the past two days, we've been trying to give him his whole blood pressure medication to keep his blood pressure where it should be. But we put parameters around it to say, you know, if his blood pressure is less than this amount, Please, nurse, please do not give him this blood pressure med. And I've noticed he's met that parameter. His blood pressure might not be low by our definition, but for someone who has a diagnosis of high blood pressure to be essentially now nanotensive, have nano blood pressure without taking their medication, that's an alarm, right? Because that tells you something's wrong. That could be in an hour, in a day, in a couple of days, they're going to bottom out and become very sick. And then they become that patient who, like, is hypotensive, low blood pressure, we're worried. And you need to be able to catch those early signs and figure out what you think is going on, what testing you need to do. Ta- obviously, talk to the patient and figure out like what you think is going on, what tests you need to do to head that all by the pants. Because right now, you may, someone who doesn't know Mr. Smith may look in his chart and think, but well, his blood pressures are great. But for you, that is what we call relative hypotension. He's already, you just don't know it yet. And he's not coolly declared himself, but you need to head that off at the pass because now it's sort of, if I was running with my team, that versus the patient who has congestive heart failure, who has a lot of fluid on it, and we're trying to take that fluid off, and it seems to be going well. I will say, let's go see Mr. Smith first. And this is why. Mm-hmm. Like, he may look fine because you're looking at his, li- his vital signs and they're normal, but hey, look over here. Right? Like, this is where like you have to be a bit boiled the ocean. Like, look. He's not been getting his home blood pressure medicine. So this is low for him. Sure. We need to go see him, figure out what's going on now. That is more important than the person who's sort of on autopilot getting uh-huh. medication. That's the one reason. And actually, I can give one sort of story that happened to me when I was a very new attending that has started with me. They have the patient who had congestive heart failure and was in the hospital because they had a lot of they were retaining a lot of fluid and we needed to, they needed IV medications to get that fluid off so that their heart's not working as hard. They were in the hospital for at least two weeks, I think by the time I came on. And the patient was, you know, he's an older gentleman, sometimes was confused, but was billed as sort of like he's in the hospital, he's ill, so it's probably delirium. And that even though his feet were a little purpley, but it's been like that for years. So it's not any, you know, it's, you can see official expression. It's not any yeah. worth it, right? <laughs> and so, you know, but like, you know, his blood pressure is on low issue, but it's been like that for years. But then over the course of the next few days, it, we went from being able to give him IV medication yeah. to get him down 
to needing to skip a couple of doses because his, he wouldn't tolerate it, meaning his blood pressure would drop too low each time. And then he went from being able to take a medication that's known to have long-term good effects on the heart in terms of, you know, uh, reducing mortality from heart failure. And he was taking it fine, but we had to go from 10 milligrams to like five milligrams because he couldn't tolerate 10 milligrams to two and a half. And all this was happening. We're just, you know, sort of lost in the middle of everything that's going on with this patient yeah. until one night when he coded. Yeah. And as we looked at what was going on with Richard Retrofit, that's why I'm going back to that early signs are very important. On the surface, it looked like he was cruising, right? Feet have been purple for years. And just so our listeners know, dusty feet, sometimes an indication of heart. blood is not getting all the way to the feet really well, but also like, and he's always sort of been this way. He's still getting some diabetes. So it's a pain to pull up the medical record and have to look at, you know, most patients are like a bazillion medications and to try to find and then see, even though you ordered this medication, is the patient getting it? And if they're not getting it, figuring out why. So he was getting some and not getting some. So really, was it like just maybe the patient declined? But sometimes it was recorded that the patient was declining the medication. He was still getting fluid off, right? It was like, oh, you know, he's still getting this medication for long term effect on the heart. So, and there was none of that, like, wait, he's getting it, yes, but he's being able to tolerate it less and less and less. And those should have been warning signs too. Mm-hmm. They ended up being, hey, I was in cardiogenic. She's heart was this one just stopped working. Sure. And maybe he would have gone in there anyway. But if we had recognized that this was already an emergency four days ago, before he coded, we would have gotten cardiology and all the necessary people, right? But yeah. use that to illustrate the, even the so-called not sick and the so-called, you know, patients in that cringy, frosty middle, you know, they're stable and on the floor. I think one of the skills of hospital medicine is always remaining inquisitive because patients who can even look acute but stable, their early warning signs become, before they become like that patient in the emergency room or ICU that you're coded, that you need to catch and act pretty quickly because you usually don't have a lot of time before things go south. Yeah. You're describing almost like this, like the parable of, you know, boiling the frog, right? Like the temperature sort of like slowly climbs slowly, until right. all of a sudden it's there or or almost like the death by a thousand paper cuts example of things, right? Like there's all these little, right. these little details. One of the things we talk about a lot is the importance of being hypervigilant for disconfirming evidence, right? Like your your brain wants you to have a clean, clear cut, low stress picture of what's happening and it, and it right. nudges you away from things that, that, are cognitively harder to deal with things that don't quite make sense. Like, well, why is it like that? Well, why is it like that? And so you really have to be in or out of a crisis. You know, you have to train your team to really pay attention to things, to signals that are away from your current direction. Um, right. I can really agree. And, and I would even add to that, even though this is slightly tangential, right? When we're talking about working as a hospitalist team, it's not uncommon for, you know, you to walk into the morning, there might be a patient like the patient I'm describing or someone else where you know, you're trying to round, you're trying to see all the new patients and learn about them that you have not yet. And you find out that maybe a patient like I've described has become hypotensive while somebody else is getting more and more short of breath or this other person is threatening to leave the hospital and give medical advice, which is in sort of emergency. That's what you're right, especially if it's unsafe. And that hospitalist leader in that, in that sense, that they're like, not, no, it's not just one emergency. There are three or four and they're all of different flavors, right? It's one right. thing if they were all the same thing. Right. You need to be able to quickly say, okay, again, going back to the example I gave yeah. earlier, but now you're, it's about residents. So you also need to make this a teaching moment. You also need to make sure they're supported. So it's like, okay, we need to go see this person. You, can you please put in orders for this for this person? Hey, do you feel comfortable going to see that person? Text me or page me if you're not. Right. Or you can, and they're sicker and we'll come meet you. And being able to make sure you're supporting the team while taking care of four or five different emergencies at the same time or moving patients to other level of care while making sure that that new patient you still need to see and don't know anything about yet is actually seen. So that is not a typical there's, um, there is so um, many layers to this and so many, so many challenges superimposed on, on top of it. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of, of a lot of the extant questions we haven't even touched on. Like you're describing leading teams. We didn't even look at that first bucket of hyper-local knowledge and how to develop it or, 
we're already essentially at the end of our time for this episode, which is amazing. <laughs> but before we close out, I, I want to give you a chance to issue a challenge to folks. If anything comes to mind that you'd like them to do differently, right? So people listening to this who you know, are thinking about vertical and longitudinal decision-making or thinking about how to juggle multiple competing priorities, what do you want them to do differently tomorrow? What do you want them to try? Hey, let me think about that. I think I would say, you know, all of us, regardless of what, whether you're in medicine or you're not in medicine, or even in your personal life, we always have multiple different things that are pulling, pulling us at the same time. And so I think that skill set of, again, you've had me say five million times, be sick, not sick, but I would use that same, some dichotomy and say, what are the things that I, if five people are approaching you, I'll say, I need you and I need you now. I challenge you to take a second. A lot of us, I think, panic. And that's understandable. That's a like human behavior. Uh, and sometimes we may go to the person who is yelling the loudest. We may sure. go to the point meaning sound the sickness, but take a moment and ask yourself, what other information do I need? The bare minimum. What is it? Who do I need to ask? And where do I need to go first? I think it's a skill set, even in other areas of our lives, that I think is underutilized. We tend to just gravitate towards who's loudest or who on the surface Cool, appear sick as so the problem that's most on fire. But I think taking that one second to breathe and figure out what you need to know to triage, I think is the challenge. Okay. That's an awesome challenge that, that staying in the pocket almost, right? Like holding the discomfort of having everybody pulling at you and being like, all right, what do I really need to do? And I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to invoke, uh, you know, the, the right of the podcast host to issue a second challenge on top of that, which is that we talked about it briefly, but but if you're in a situation where you're training and you're training next to a group that's training differently from you, how can you get humble and ask them for what they're doing best? Because I wish that was a skill I was better at when you and I were training together at Mass General. I think that would have served me and, and my team very well uh, to be more humble and to ask more questions and to, to try to really absorb as much as possible of the mindsets and mental models of the folks around you. So yeah, so if you're listening to that, how can you build those bridges? I can believe it. I think that's awesome. I should have said that. They go with that. Go with that challenge. <laughs> no, no, no. I love, I love yours. I love yours. Oh, uh, and Kim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Just like such a pleasure. Folks are so lucky to, to hear from you about this and, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Now, this was a lot of fun. I'm sort of sad our time's over, but yeah, this was great. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind. Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure, and you can find it at emergencymind.com slash book. All right, good luck out there.